You may have noticed I've somewhat lowered the quality. We are no longer in HD. This is only because uh, dealing with all of these HD video files is a bit annoying with regards to storage management when I'm editing these. Uh, so I've lowered the quality to like around 480p, I don't remember exactly what it is, just below HD. Hopefully it doesn't matter too much, I think it's fine, I think it looks perfectly fine. Um, so, you know, whatever. I used to do videos in much lower resolution than this and no one complained, so uh, I, I don't know why I care about this. Anyway, the, the original point of this series, the original question that I wanted to ask with this series, now I know it's kind of a pretentious way to phrase it, but the original question I wanted to ask with this series was this. What if you had an insomnia analysis every day to watch? What if you could, what if I made insomnia, a new insomnia analysis every day, right? Like a, you haven't seen insomnia analysis, basically the video that inspired this entire channel and in some ways the entire Denver YouTube movement as a whole. Uh, what if you made one of those videos every day? That's what the first night shift video is. The first night shift video is just that. It's like, uh, I was very interested in this idea of, you know, I've been hamming on for so long about, like, intense innovation that you just have to create something that's entirely novel and new. And if you're not saying anything entirely novel and new, there's no point in making art. Until I took a look at anime, right, which is, uh, always a good thing to do and you know that whole firstly that whole thought pattern of you know beating myself up for not being able to do something completely new and innovative every single time I make something uh, was was become caused me to have a little bit of a crisis um well I was you know screaming about the existence of a hundred gex <laughs> getting mad about hyper pop um which I thought was I still stand by those points but um it wasn't good, it wasn't a, a good uh, attitude to have, because it's expecting too much. No one makes something completely new and innovative every single time they make anything. No one in the history of the world, that's not how art works. Art is not, you know, original. Every art piece is um, derivative of all the things that inspired it, and then all the things that inspired the things that inspired it, and the things that inspired those, and going back to the beginning of time. All art is derivative, so saying you need to make something completely original every single time is kind of nonsense and also completely subjective. Because uh, what you see as original, someone else might notice the derivative parts of it that you say, well, that's just because I was inspired, you know, what's inspiration, what's derivation, etc, etc. It's not a very good attitude to have. So I looked towards anime. I looked towards the stuff I really like, the, the art that really speaks to me, which is mostly you know, slice of life anime and stuff like that. Um, now, the thing about slice of life anime, the reason I love slice of life so much is, and the reason I love these type of videos so much, you know, not necessarily my ones, but the ones by that one anime YouTuber I forgot the name of, and the ones by my friends, uh, and the ones by, you know, that one anime YouTuber I forgot the name of, friends back in the day, and people like, um, you know, uh, Simple Flips, and, you know, Let's Play podcasts, all of these YouTubers that I really am into, the appeal is the exact same as Slice of Life anime. The appeal is it's it's a a a, a peek in on a friendship, right? It's sort of a um a, 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 I don't want to say a parasocial. I mean, it is a parasocial relationship, but it's not an unhealthy one. It's it's a it's um I I it's like a just getting to experience a friend dynamic that you would never be able to have in any other situation because friend dynamics are really interesting. Um, and so the idea that you can like not only have you, but here's the thing about friend dynamics is you'll only have friend dynamics where you're one of the friends. You'll only be able to ever experience that firsthand. But with these sorts of mediums like YouTube vlogs, let's plays, um, and slice of life anime, stuff like that, you get to experience, you know, sort of vicarious friendship, and not in a way where it's like substituting for real friendship. It's not like that. It's much more, you know, wholesome, if you, you want to say. Like, it's much more like, you know, this isn't a replacement for my friendship. I don't pretend that I even would be friends with, you know, I don't know, <laughs> the the characters in Lucky Star or whatever. I, I don't pretend that they would want anything to do with me in real life. If I was to talk to them, the point is that I don't have to talk to them. I can just, they're fictional characters. I, I get to watch them go about their day and interact in an interesting way, 
and that's interesting for me and fun for me. And it's the same thing with, you know, vlogs and let's plays and all the same sort of thing. It's like, you sort of are an invisible person in the room watching someone else and they're, you know, getting to experience their interesting friend dynamics. It's the same appeal, it's the exact same appeal. And so I looked at Slice of Life anime and I realized I've been taking the complete wrong approach. Because the thing is, and I already talked about this in one of the earlier videos, the thing is that shows like, you know, Yuyushiki, Lucky Star, uh, fucking K-On, Hidemai Sketch, Gochi, like they're all basically the same show, just over and over again. They're all just the same show over and over again. They basically have the same elements. They're pretty much like just rip-offs of each other, and they're all rip-offs of Azamanga Daio. Like, four cute girls in high school do cute things would be the, in the West, would be the name of, would be the plot of one show. But in, in anime, that's the plot of a whole genre. They all have the same plot. They all, you know, they're the same show over and over again. But they have subtle differences between them, right? Obviously, otherwise no one will watch them. But really, they have a formula that works, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They they have, um, you know, this this thing that people like, and they like making, and so they just make it again, because it's already good. Why would you fuck with it? If you already, you know, you, you make something good, and you just keep iterating on that same idea over and over again and making subtle tweaks to make it better or different or unique in a certain way, but not like crazy. Not like, oh, everything... It's not like I have to start from a place of complete uniqueness and then work in inspirations. It's the complete opposite. You start from a place of derivation. You start from a place of iterating upon something that's already good. And then you add your own little thing to it, you know, to make each one slightly different from each other. So, like, you know, the tone might be slightly different, the characters might have slightly different quirks or personality, you know, stuff like that. Same thing I can do with my YouTube channel. I can take this videos, uh, these videos that, and, and styles that inspired me, you know, Insomnia Analysis and all of those uh, in the similar vein, and just do them again, because it, they're not getting made anymore, right? That, that one anime YouTuber, who I forgot the name of, is trying somehow, even though they don't exist anymore, they're somehow trying to continue this legacy, or keep making videos like this, they're not good. They've, they've, they're, they're not the same thing. They're trash. Um, they, they are just a completely different thing. I know a few people probably like them, but I do not. Uh, they are just not the same thing, because, you know, they, they, ve they veered too far off the path, and so, if no one else is making this thing that I like, and I want to see more of it, why don't I just make more of it? And that was the idea behind Night Shift, is just rip, straight off, rip it off. Straight off, rip it off, just make my own version of it. No fucking meta commentary, no postmodern bullshit, just make my own version of the thing I already like. Obviously, we've, gone, we've come a bit far since then, we've moved on a bit since then. You see, now, that is not the point of this series at all. That is not the point of this series. The point of this series is no longer make an insomnia analysis every single day. The point of this series now is make a breakfast video every single day. The point isn't make an insomnia analysis every day, it's make a video containing 30 minutes of notable thoughts. That is all it is. It's 30-ish minutes, 30 to maybe 30, to, 30 minutes to an hour every day of notable thoughts. Not particularly interesting or exciting thoughts or innovative thoughts or um, deep thoughts, you know, not, not that, just notable, like, huh, here's something I, here's something I had an idea of, and it's just, oh yeah, I suppose that is, that is mildly, no that is, that is just about notable, that is worth taking note of, that's all these videos are, it's 30 minutes to an hour every day of notable words, notable thoughts, that is all I have to produce, and why? Because I want to solve a problem, and the problem is, that I, I don't have videos to watch at breakfast. Now, I can't watch my own videos, I don't find that very interesting, and I already watch them when I'm editing them, so I don't want to watch my own video once when I'm saying it, once when I'm editing it, and then once when I'm watching it back for breakfast. Not good. Don't, I'm not that egotistical. I'm pretty egotistical, but that's too far even for me. Um, but it's a problem that other people have too, and I wanted to solve that problem. I wanted to do a public service, you know, and solve that problem too. And that's how, that's how we've ended up. We've ended up completely quite far away from the original vision, because I realised that an insomnia analysis every day, the thing about doing a good insomnia analysis video, it requires drinking. I've tried doing them without drinking, it's not the same. You have to be drinking beer. You, and it has to be specifically beer. You have to be drinking beer when you're making an insomnia analysis video, and drinking beer every night to make a video is not a healthy lifestyle to live. I will gladly drink beer every night, but not in a way where I have to feel obligated, like, oh, I have to get drunk tonight. Don't want to do that. 
you know, also I haven't really been drinking that much recently, which is probably a good thing. Also, I stopped drinking beer because it has too many calories. We had a bunch of problems with this whole situation. Um, you have to drink to make an insomnia analysis video. You have to be not only drink, but you have to be slightly drunk. You can't just be sipping on one beer. You have to be like, it's not a sustainable way to make videos. It's, it's not healthy. Um, but even if you want to try and do them without drinking, they also require a specific vibe. And sometimes I don't ha I don't, I'm not in that vibe. I'm not in that mood. So I move to a more flexible formula where I can, you know, do whatever I want. I can have one video where, hey, look, this video is just about me making an omelette and you can see the atmosphere of the rainy day. And it has a musical interlude with some B-roll of the rain on the roofs and stuff like that. You know, it's very peaceful, sort of Iyashi K, calming type of atmosphere in a video, and I can have another video where I spend the whole video stressing out about, you know, trying to fix something in Linux, and I can have another video where I'm doing some repetitive menial task, like, um, organizing some big list I have, or something like that, right? Uh, th these are the things, it's much more flexible like this, because all it has to be is 30 minutes to an hour of notable thoughts, and that's much easier to, to produce, you know, I, I probably have about 30 minutes worth of notable thoughts every day, I definitely do, otherwise I, I wouldn't have been able to continue these videos for as long as I have, although it's questionable how notable some of the thoughts are. But really what this is, is how anyone else would have used Tumblr back in the day, or, you know, any other micro-blogging platform. You know, maybe not Twitter, but a blog, it's a blog, it's a really very literal video blog, it, a vlog, right? It's a very literal, like, it's, it's too long for a tweet, but it's not an essay, it's just a notable thought that I'm posting on my video blog for you all to watch while eating breakfast. Now, is this series still called Night Shift? I don't know. I don't know if this series is still called Night Shift. You know, Night Shift doesn't really apply anymore. It's, it's daytime. I'm pointing at the window, but you, you can't see it. It's, 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 it's bloody daytime. I mean, it's like 6 a.m., but it's, it's daytime. It's not Night Shift, it's daytime. <laughs> what is it? So I, I thought of another title. Um, one title was just breakfast videos. You know, it's a very descriptive, uh, uh, very descriptive title. Breakfast videos. Uh, some people have even been calling it that in the comments without me even asking. So maybe you can call these breakfast videos. Or if you want a more formalized title, I was thinking something like um, uh, "Watch me the night before, the morning after," something like that. That's a bit of a mouthful. So. Whatever, this series doesn't need a title. Uh, you can just say it's, I'm making breakfast videos. You can keep calling it Night Shift if you want. I don't care. But um, it's not really Night Shift because it's not really embodying anywhere near the same attitude as the first video. But maybe when my sleep cycle flips back around to where I'm sleeping at night or staying up all night, but like sleeping, you know, right now I'm staying up all night, but that's when I wake up. I wake up at midnight or, you know, so I wake up either like late, to, they said I woke up at like 10, 8, 10 p.m. So, you know, that's sort of, I'm, and I'm awake through the whole night and I go to sleep at like 3 p.m. That's not accepted. That's not a good night shift because you, a night shift has to, has to have the sleepy vibes. It has to be the actual nighttime before you go to sleep, not the nighttime that's actually when you've just woken up. So it um, doesn't really work to make... You know what I'm trying to say. Anyway, that's something. History of these videos? I don't know. So I just watched Plunder's response video to my video segment in my video where I talk about favorites, and it's a great video. Um, we're currently talking about it in the DMs. Um, uh, go watch it. It's on Harsh Noise Pain Slut, the best channel on YouTube. Uh, so, Plunder's video is great, but it's not quite about the same thing that I was talking about, and the reason is because I didn't explain myself very well. Uh, I used a word, signaling, without defining my terms very well. So when I use the word signaling, I'm using it in a way that I learned from another YouTube channel called Killing Asuka. Great YouTube channel. Sadly, the uh, guy who the, the, the guy who runs it uh, passed away not so long ago. But a uh, great YouTube channel that I recommend. Um, but um, he uses signaling in a specific way, which is the idea that sort of... Uh, I think it comes from some... If I can remember, I think he, I think he got his, he get it, he got it from some economist called uh, something Hansen. I don't remember, but uh, I don't think he's using it correctly in the way that that economist uses it. I don't know. Listen, I don't know. I don't know. He's he's on he's on a higher IQ level than I am, so I can't. You know, I don't know what he's on about. But the way I interpret it, at least, is this: that human beings are constantly signaling, and it's mostly an unconscious thing. But all human behavior 
is social signaling in some sense. Even the decision to actively not socially signal is still a form of signaling, it's called counter signaling. Or, you know, to send a signal because you're still signaling that all human behavior, whether you want to or not, is signaling in some aspect. Everything you do, whether you want to do it, burn you, whether you're doing it consciously to signal something, for example, fashion, you might wear a gold chain because you want to signal that you look cool or that you have money, that you can, you have disposable income or, you know, that you want to fit in with a particular uh, fashion subculture or, you know, you might have a certain haircut because you want people to think you're attractive. You know, these are all conscious forms of signaling, but there are also many unconscious forms of signaling. For example, something like the tone of your voice. Sometimes you're in direct control of the tone of your voice, but most of the time it's subconscious. You're not really thinking about it. It happens due to your emotions and your situation. Um, or you could go even further, uh, something like, uh, you know, your maybe your body language, or you could go into, like, um, even, you know, more broad concepts, like, uh, what job do you have, or um, everything you do, all behavior you can, you can do, what hobbies do you have, even stuff that you don't show people, is social signaling, you, you are telling the world something about yourself, it's not the same way that, uh, it's not the way that um, I think Plunder might have interpreted it, which is this idea of purposefully signaling to something to look cool. And again, this is my fault because I used an example of that in the video. But it's not necessarily that. When you make a, a favorites list, you're already doing a bunch of signaling before you even finish the list. You're signaling the fact that I'm into this medium enough that I can that I can make a list. Like that's a signal you're sending, or you're signaling I'm a sort of person who enjoys making lists. You're signaling I'm a sort of person who enjoys you know adding numeric values to my tastes and and categorizing and databasing things. I'm the sort of person, and that's before you even get to what the contents of the list is. You're already sending a bunch of signals, even if it's I'm the sort of person who has a my anime list profile, or you know. Even I'm the sort of person with enough free time that I can dedicate to watching an enough anime that I can make a list of. Like, there are so many signals we're sending just through the act of making a favorites list in the first place. Now, most of those are, you know, semi unconscious, but you're sending signals because every action you perform has some sort of meaning. And people can look at whatever signals you're sending and, um, you know, they 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 send they, they send some sort of information about you. That's what I mean when I say signaling. Not necessarily I'm going to put Ojimajo Doremi on my list because it will make me look cool. But you know, the, the, that might be a part of it. That might be a form of signaling. But that's not the only form of signaling. Even if you say, I'm going to make sure that my list is 100% honest and has nothing to do with looking cool on the internet. That's counter signaling. That's still signaling because you're still telling you're still putting the information out there that. You're still doing the action. You're still doing any action, and doing any action is a form of signaling. And all signaling is social because we live in society. We live in a society <laughs> because we live in a society um, where other people will see your signals. And so all signaling is social signaling. And therefore, all signaling is, in a sense, status signaling because, um, you know, primate status hierarchies and so on. So that that's really what I meant. Um, but other than, other than that misunderstanding, which was mostly my fault for not explaining myself very well, um, the video that Plunder made is great and makes some great points about how, like, you know, you, you'd you have to have a full conversation with someone to really understand anything about their taste. You know, someone could, like, um, so, for example, uh, I might say, so, or Plunder might say, um, Blood on the Dance Floor is their favorite band, and you might say, what the fuck is wrong with you? But if you have a conversation with them and, you know, they explain it to you, then you might say, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense to me. It's the same sort of thing. So you might at first think, oh, that's just shit taste, until you have a conversation with someone. Or, on the other side, you might think, like, oh, you like Hunter x Hunter? That's such generic normie taste. Or you like even something like, you like, uh, oh, you like, uh... I don't know, Marvel movies? That's such generic normie taste. But then when you have a conversation with someone and they explain, oh yeah, I like Hunter x Hunter because I, I have a, I've written a big chart on my wall, or I have a big spreadsheet with every character's Nen powers and how they interact with each other, and, you know, I, I have, like, a tattoo of, 
gone on my body or like I don't know you or like you know there's so many different ways you can enjoy something that you never really know what it means to someone so you you know it could be that someone likes a certain thing because you know they just had momentary enjoyment of that thing or even because they think it would be a good social signal to present themselves as liking that thing but also it could be that they like something for a completely unique reason that only they would understand or you wouldn't be able to understand without a, a long conversation with them um, and even then, you know, you can only understand so much about another person. Evangelion. <laughs> the Hedgehog Dilemma. Hedgehog Dilemma. Hedgehog Dilemma. You know, you can only understand a certain amount about another person. Uh, all of those points are great. And uh, don't listen to me say them. Go watch Plunder say them. While we're talking about taste, uh, recently I watched two movies. Two, two movies which are proclaimed as two of the best movies ever made. Uh, the first one was Bicycle Thieves, uh, the Italian neorealist film, and the second one was Breathless, the French New Wave film. Um, now, Bicycle Thieves is often touted as one of the best movies ever, both of these are touted as some of the best movies ever made. Um, now, I have some opinions. <laughs> so, Bicycle Thieves, I thought had some good elements to it. Um, the directing was incredible, the acting well, the physical performance was great. We'll talk about, about more of that in a second. Even the child actor was surprisingly good. Um, you know, and the storyline was um, a, a very interesting, particularly if you, I, after I read up more about the context of this movie and what the Italian neorealist movement was, uh, like, the idea of writing this sort of small-scale story about a guy who just needs his fucking bike or his, his, you know, he needs a job to feed his kids, he really needs his bike, and so he has no choice but to wander through Rome, just looking at rows and rows of bikes, and those shots that just pass by the rows and rows of bikes, and then they do like a reverse shot of them just like looking at the bikes, and it's like the desperation you feel in that moment, it's such a, like a subtle emotion, right, because it's like, you can read so much into what the characters are going through, because the act of just walk like, without context, the act of just walking past a row of bikes looking at them is relatively neutral. But the context of what must be going through those characters' minds and the sort of, the, situ the whole situation they're in is very interesting. It's it, a great, very well done, um, um, obviously. I'm here praising one of the most praised movies ever made. Really good. However, <laughs> and here's where, here's where people might disagree with me. Here's where people might disagree with me. Uh, or might think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bastard. This is equivalent to, um, uh, this is a bit of a meme in my circles, but this is equivalent to, uh, I don't like No Game No Life because of the colours. You know, something that's really not you know, anything to do with the content of the show, but like, something that you just can't look past because it just frustrates you too much that you could, you know, to enjoy the rest of the show. Um, I, this is now my version of that, which is the fact that, um, I don't know the exact full story behind it, but as I understand it, the directors didn't like the voice, or maybe they just didn't get good audio on set, but as far as I understand, the voice of the lead actor is not the voice of the lead actor. It's all dubbed afterwards by a different actor, not the person who actually played the person. And I think the person who actually played the, the lead character, the, the actor who did their you know performance on set, was uh, was not a professional actor. I'm not sure, but I don't I don't think they were a professional actor. I think they were just a you know to get that super realistic vibe. I don't think they were a professional actor. Um, but they afterwards dubbed his voice by an actual professional actor. Now, again, this this it might frustrate people who really love this film, but I just couldn't fucking handle it because the voice doesn't quite line up with the lips, and it was just so annoying to me because it's all dubbed over in after after in post by someone who was a completely different person, dubbing over all of the voice lines. I know they're in Italian, but still, I can see that what he's saying doesn't match up with his lips. And it's different in animation because, you know, it's it's more abstracted. But when you see it in, in a, a real person speaking and their voice doesn't line up with their lips, like, this is the same reason I can't watch, I like, whenever I watch old Hong Kong action movies and all that stuff like that, I always watch it subtitled. Because dubs are just, in live action, dubs are so annoying. Um, and even in animation, you know, I don't want to watch an English dub or something, but, like, I I could forgive, you know, anime TV shows for not having the lips line up perfectly, um, just due to, sort of, I, I don't know why. I don't know why, honestly. Maybe it's just because of the abstraction of animation, I don't really think about it. 
Uh, like in the same way that I don't get frustrated when I'm reading a visual novel and the characters are saying a voice line and their, line, their lips don't move because it's just sort of a picture. It's the same sort of thing in animation. But when it's in real life and you can see someone's lips moving, a real person's lips moving, and, you know, as a human being, I'm very, very used to the look of someone moving their lips when they're talking and what... And it doesn't quite like... It's so annoying to me. I can't... And so I literally couldn't finish the movie because of that. Because I just was so constantly frustrated. A little niggling thing in my mind of just like, eh, the lips don't quite line up with what he's saying. Ah, it doesn't quite line up. Ah. And like, also as a musician I'm very familiar with like audio and so I'd see like him in a in like a setting in a street or in a building where the sound of his voice would sound completely different but I can hear the proximity effect of someone recording his dubbed lines in a studio right next to a microphone how it doesn't sound anything like you know that's very obvious ADR it just doesn't sound anything like what his voice would naturalistically sound like in that environment and it was just too annoying for me I couldn't finish the fucking movie because of that and I, I know that's bad and I should probably go back and finish it because other than that and the one other thing which um, you know might frustrate people even more than that uh, but that was my main problem was just uh, it was it was hard for me to, <laughs> to, to, to to keep faith in the movie even though it has such great emotional depth and cinematography and you know all of these sorts of things the other thing now this this might be even worse that was really annoying to me, and I've started doing it, is this. I thought this was a racist stereotype. They all, they don't do any other gesture. They only do this. <laughs> they only do this. I thought it was a stereotype. I didn't realise it was real. I didn't realise that Italians actually only do this, no matter what they're talking about. I couldn't, I couldn't take anything seriously. Even though I understand on a logical level the emotional depth of what was going on, every time a character did this when talking, I just couldn't take the fucking film seriously anymore. But I, I, I don't know why. I, don't, I, I thought, because this whole time I've been operating as if the Italians always doing this is like a, a joke meme racial stereotype. And then I'm watching a movie where a whole group of real Italian people are constantly doing this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you I I can't, take it, I can't take anything seriously in the movie because everyone's always gesturing like this and the mouth doesn't match up with what you're saying. So I'm sorry for hating on what is probably what is regarded as one of the best movies ever made for two really stupid things that are completely my fault for finding, um, you know, immersion breaking or annoying or whatever. Uh, the other film I watched was Jean-Luc Godard's first movie, Breathless, which came out in 1960. See? That is my fact-remembering brain. Um, because I did some, I loved it so much that I did some research about the French New Wave after I watched it. Um, I read the Roger Ebert review of it even, which is, you know, I've never read it. I've always wondered, why do people love Roger Ebert so much? Because I've only seen videos of him talking or like clips of his voice and he it just seems like a, any other film critic. Like, why do people love him so much? But I read his review of Breathless and then after that I read a bunch of his other reviews of movies I've seen. And uh, now I understand it. He's a much better writer than he is a speaker. He's, de he's definitely a very evocative reviewer and critic and writer. So now I understand why people like Roger Ebert so much. But anyway, Breathless was fucking great. I loved Breathless. Um, one of the things I thought about it is that y there are people who say this is the first modern movie are completely right. I, I actually also, as, along with the Roger Ebert review, I read a review, I don't remember who it was, but it was an English review that I just found on the internet that was written when it came out or when it released in America um, and they literally described the pacing as frantic they said it's the frantic pacing of the movie the movie doesn't have frantic pacing by modern standards in fact it's also, it's actually quite meandering um, it's one of the things I like about it is you know there's like a 15 minute sequence where the characters are just sort of lying in bed you know flirting and talking where uh, the main character is sort of trying to convince the woman to sort of have sex with him while the woman is it's a very it's got a lot of stuff going on you know you get to learn about you you saw this, you see the main character the main character sort of puts on a front I'm not good with names uh, but you see how the main character sort of puts on a front to sort of act tough when really he's like you can see he's actually just desperate to he's he's kind of desperate to have sex with this woman you know he just comes across as kind of needy and desperate whereas the woman comes across as sort of disinterested and um you know, honestly has a lot more going on in behind her eyes, like she's clearly much more intelligent than him, um, and you know, has a, 
you can see how you can see their emotional maturity. That's what I'm talking about. You can see their juxtaposed sort of emotional maturity in the scene, and you get a great sense of character. And then later on in the movie, that scene comes back because uh, later on in the movie, uh, the woman she says, or, or the guy, I don't remember who says it, but one of them says, um, when we were we were hanging out, um, you were only talking about yourself, and I was only talking about myself. Whereas I should have been talking about you, and you should have been talking about me. And that scene that happens earlier, the one I'm talking about, you get to see that in action. So that's what they're sort of referring to: is the guy literally will just ignore what she says, and she will just completely ignore what the guy says, and they'll just talk about whatever individual thing they want to talk about. You know, she'll just talk about, "I've been reading this book. Have you read it?" And he'll be like, "Take off your dress, baby." <laughs> it's a, uh, you know, it's that sort of scene. But it goes on, it just goes on and on and on with all of this, like, they're just smoking endless cigarettes and just, like, wandering around her apartment. It's a, it's a great scene. But that is, like, not, that would be cut out in a modern movie, or at least cut down. Um, like, the, to call that frantic pacing just goes to show how shit the pacing was in old movies. Before the, the fucking new wave, like, movies just didn't know how to pace themselves. And, of, of course, like, um, it wasn't directly the, you know... You could say that Breathless was the first modern movie, or you could maybe say that um, uh, uh, Body and Clyde was the first modern movie. Again, I'm, uh, I'm going to watch that soon. That's probably the next movie I'll watch. Or maybe um, another Godard film, I'm not sure. Something something similar in that sort of vein, just because of how much I like Breathless. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, it has a lot of character depth and emotional weight to, to everything they're saying. But it also has like... Um, a sort of like cool irony about it, which I, I really like, uh, or like, it's not necessarily the film itself has a cool irony to it, but the film itself is actually almost the opposite. It's it's almost shot in a documentary style. Um, famously, it has some like handheld shots, which would have been very impractical uh, when cameras were as big as they were in 1960. But it has some like handheld shots to give it like a documentary feel. Um, it's very interesting. So the the film itself, the the way it's shot and stuff is incredibly naturalistic, but then you have, for example, you even, and to even add to the sort of almost documentary feel, you have moments where the main character just, or other characters even, just look directly into the camera and sort of acknowledge the audience in, in almost like a soliloquy. So I just had to show off that I know the word soliloquy. <laughs> uh, what a great movie. Uh, you, you get these weird, like, cuts which, um, I, I forget, there's a word for them, but they're, they're sort of like jump cuts, like cuts within cuts, so where they'll like, they'll cut, but but it's just to a later point in time with the same camera angle. Um, and as far as I read from these reviews, that was really done by accident. It didn't, because uh, the film was too long and they just wanted to cut out the boring parts um, where people weren't talking. But it adds to this really kind of dreamlike, it's such a weird atmosphere, it's such a unique and... Um, well-crafted atmosphere that, like, uh, you know, it has this naturalistic documentary vibe, but it also feels completely unreal. Like, um, if it feels completely dreamlike and um, almost, uh, you know, the constructed reality. It's sort of like making a documentary about a place that doesn't really exist. It's almost like the Navison record in um, fucking House of Leaves, you know? Like a documentary about a place that isn't real. A fictional documentary. It's almost like that. But it's not, because it's, it's not pretending to be a documentary. But, um, like, it has this simultaneously, like, grounded filmmaking, and then a tone which is very sort of ab... or somewhat, you know, dreamlike and abstract and unreal on purpose. Um, I, I think Roger Ebert said something along the lines of, like, a uh, whereas classic Hollywood films and, and um... Fuck, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it's something about how, like, um... Like, these these old films that inspired Godard were, like... They, they came from a, a sense of heightened Hollywood... They came from, like, a heightened Hollywood reality, and then they would inject it with emotional realism. Whereas Breathless came from a place of emotional realism and injected it with heightened reality. I think that's what he said, I might be wrong. But, uh, something along those lines anyway. What a great film. This is the thing. Old films are too fucking slow paced. They say they they're shit. They none of the characters are like believable. And in this film the characters aren't particularly like, you know, super mumblecore realistic, but they're like 
they have like and I'm not saying old films don't have layers of motivation. Of course old films have layers of motivation. Uh, this isn't like a blanket statement about films being, you know, old films didn't know what they were doing. I'm mostly impressed by the pacing and like the the, uh, the atmosphere that was created and how fucking, like, how the main character is simultaneously really cool. Like he's the coolest guy. He's just the coolest guy ever. But he's also like really pathetic and desperate because it's all a front, because he's he's actually like basically underneath it all a scared little boy. Um, and how that's all communicated without ever having to say it to the audience. You just know that because you can just, like the depth of the performance and the script, like it's all just in there. None of it's, none of that is like, you know, how it would be in a, a modern sort of shitty movie where, you know, they would make it really obvious that that's going on. It's all sort of subtle under the surface between the line stuff where it's all in the performance and the, the, the stuff like that. Great movie. Highly recommend. Uh, my, my friend Devil's Palm, aka LV, uh, said it's a bit overrated. Um, I haven't seen that many French New Wave films. In fact, I've only seen this one. So maybe there's other ones that are better. Uh, but I really like it, especially for considering the effect it had on cinema. And especially considering the context, because one of the things I like about it is so, you know how critics, like movie critics or whatever, they always get this comment of like, oh yeah, you want to be all critical? I bet you couldn't do any better. Well, Godard was just like, uh, okay, and then revolutionized cinema permanently, forever. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can do better. And then he just changed, he, he did so much better that no one ever looked back. That, that's just so cool to me. Um, so yeah, Breathless, great movie. That, uh, quite different from Bicycle Thieves. I mean, they're not, they were made quite several. I mean, yeah, they're, they're different. They're very different movies. Everyone knows this, but I, those are just two movies that I watched back, pretty much back to back, and uh, Breathless was by far my favourite out of the two.